It's an absolute delight to be here with my very old friend Guo Jen. We've known each other, we just figured out, for about 40 years, and uh, <laughs> which really dates us. Um, but the way we met, I think, is uh, probably indicative. It'll tell you something about both of us, probably. Um, we were at uh, we, it was about 1991 in Beijing and we were both attending, we didn't know each other, but we were both attending a very serious concert of modern music at the Goethe Institute that involved um, Chinese, traditional Chinese instruments. And among these instruments was a kind of a clay egg-like object. And the whole thing was so serious that I independently of Guo Jian, who was also getting the giggles, like I was just kind of getting that sort of you know, that sort of shaky thing. And then this guy gets up and his glasses are slightly skewed and he starts blowing into this clay egg. And... Shouldn't <laughs> question. Yeah, it's called a shouldn't. <laughs> and, and we both kind of separately began giggling and we were both asked to leave. So... <laughs> So we met outside the wall of the Goethe Institute. <laughs> and then we met uh, back to senior another party again, a serious party as well. Yeah, and we escaped that because I said, do you like rock? And he said, oh yes. And I said, I have two tickets for the Cruel Sea. Do you want to get out of this? Do you want to, you know, let's just bust out of this party? And we did, and we've been friends ever since. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I saw lots of, literally lots and lots of Australian rock from that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, now, when we met, it wasn't that long after uh, Guo Jian nearly lost his life on Tiananmen Square in the, um, in the crackdown on the student uh, protest for democracy in 1989, and it, wasn't, it was long before you came here. Um, Guo Jian's first exhibition uh, in Australia uh, was at Stephen Fennelly's. The journalist Stephen Fennelly had a little flat in Oxford Street. Called, uh, headspace. Called, uh, headspace. Yes. And he lived there and he had his first exhibition was Guo Jian's work. Yeah. And it sold out. Yeah. <laughs> All our friends went. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm very glad that I have a painting from that, by the way, because uh, I, I, I can't afford you any more, Guo Jian. So <laughs> since that time, uh, Guo Jian's star has certainly risen, and uh, he's, his work is collected in institutions that include GOMA in Queensland, the National Gallery in Canberra, White Rabbit, any others? What's the center for? Of the center for the uh, Chinese center for the what's it called again? Uh, the Canberra National Uni University. Oh, yeah. that's right, the center on China in yeah. the world at, yeah. the, at the Canberra National University. And we're going to be showing slides. When yeah, it was uh, like the, the whole time that time. I think it's like for kids, right? When we talk about that times, the adults really have a really really tough time, but we kids are really happy, right? Because there's no schools. Now. I was, but I was really, really attracted to the old propaganda posters, which was my dad was part of that, and he was on the truck most of the time. The, the, through the, 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 the flyers, the, all the like kind of propaganda things on the street. I was kids with me, like you know, lots of kids who were from the same street and were chasing the, uh, the truck. To, to get, get, the, get the public, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's how I grew up in the environment. I was really happy, and then my dad, they are fighting on the street. There, so. and, and among the things that you saw as, a, as an adolescent, as a young teenager, was the, um, with the, of course, the model of revolutionary operas, and among them was the red detachment of women. Tell us why you like that, honestly, why did you like that so much? <laughs> I was... Uh, <laughs> This is like I've been told this for many times now. I was just a little kind of a, a dirty, a little kind of a, a revolutionary kind of a, a young man. It was not only just me. I think most of the people in the country they all love it. Was the the time in China, the 70s? You don't really, as, especially as women, you don't really expose yourself. You, no one really kind of. You don't see the women with shots at all. And you don't have a, this kind of, a, let's say now, you can use the words now, but back in the day, you don't have the words, so erotic, right? You, we don't have that. But 
they show the propaganda, which is uh, part of the Jiang Qing's uh, uh, model uh, ballet, and, uh, for like eight of them. One of them, they literally, like the soldier uh, women, got the shots there. They, they got the, like, uh, so you can see the legs, just like that. If you look over here, here's one of uh, Guo Jian's <laughs> later reinterpretations. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, as, a, as a young man, uh, we, we love it. Uh, we did, I didn't know why I so love that. So we just go there to watch that every time. I watched that for many, many times. I couldn't remember how many times. And then most of the people that time with me, the same kind of age, or you and that adult, they all love it. And then that's, how I think, if, uh, the, one of the reasons, become one of the reasons I joined the army. Yeah. <laughs> he thought he'd see a lot of women in shorts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one of my classmates, she was, uh, uh, she grew up in the, in the army kind of uh, uh, base, and uh, she is the one literally knows how to dance about this, and then she joined the army before us. So we said, oh, okay, we join the army now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at some of uh, Guo Jian's other, uh, we'll just go through a couple more of the ones that also reference the revolutionary model operas and a kind of the eroticism of them. Uh, another one, please. <laughs> this is, uh, the, I put the TV sets there. It was the same time, it's before, just before, I, after I joined the army, China's that kind of, uh, a lot of people smuggle of, of lots of uh, things from Taiwan, from outside China, which is a part of uh, they call the erotic uh, porno kind of uh, films, which is not really. Uh, so most of the time we don't really know how to watch that. We couldn't really watch that. And then people like me, we try so hard to, to, to find out uh, where we can saw that, where we can see that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a one time it was like a, my friend literally one time he was he was a truck driver he tr drove to to, to uh, Guangzhou and he come back and hand me this kind of uh, 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 tape of uh, he said this is a porno you do you want to watch I said okay I don't even have TV set <laughs> <laughs> and I have to travel whole town to find out who have TV set and then after that, we got like more than 50 people <laughs> to, to try, travel around the whole city and find out we, someone literally have a TV set. And then we, don't have a, we didn't have the player. <laughs> and then we had to travel again and travel again and then we got more than about 100 people <laughs> all together to watch that. And when they turn up, it's just like a, literally so a woman had a shower there. <laughs> Out of the back, that's it. <laughs> a woman having a shower from the back, yeah, and a hundred of you are sitting there yeah, watching, sitting watching that. <laughs> Fantastic. So when you were 17, you decided to um, actually join the army and see if you could meet some of those girls. Um, <laughs> now at that time, uh, China had launched a border war against Vietnam. So tell us a little bit about your, you were a signals officer, then you were a regimental secretary, and then you became a propaganda artist. Tell us about your time in the military. Uh, but literally they came to town to, I, I was uh, trying like a th before, like three times before to join the army, but for all the reason they just say, I, I was too skinny, I'm not strong enough, now I'm not look like a man, that sort of thing. So <laughs> I was refused after that, but when the war started, and uh, I went to like uh, all, all the kind of uh, the boys from the school. We all have to go to the hospital to check out. And then they said I, I had the best uh, kind of uh, health condition. You know? So I was uh, joined the army, and then the, the guy came, the, the recruiter the, the, from the army, he literally came to me straight and said, We need one like you to go to the army to paint. So literally, I got uh, like a three, more than three companies want me to go to join them. So when I, but when I got there, and also one of the uh, reasons they told me, they say, after you join the army, we definitely send you to, the, uh, to Beijing to study the art in the army college. They oh. call the army uh, um, um, art college. Oh, that's interesting, because yeah. I didn't know that. That didn't actually work out that way. Yeah. But let's just talk a little yeah. bit more. Here you see a slide in which um, Guo Jian on the left is, uh, 
you know, it's just sort of a memory of, of the army. Um, you, you said they wanted you for propaganda. How did they know you could draw? I think that's why they said the audit now. I think they uh, the audit went to the local cultural uh, department or, or center. One of my really really good friends, who is uh, the guy there, I think he told them. Uh, so that's how the audit now. I know how to draw, and uh, and also at the same time they figure I'm, my backgrounds become uh, more important because they think someone like me would really fit that job now because I was uh, uh, one of the uh, kids that time in the, the cultural center or cultural environment they think I was the best that whole time yeah right yeah. and and so how did being a propaganda artist in the army how did that influence your art because you do draw on a lot of propaganda in your art to the present day, as, as you will see soon. Yeah, but they, they, <laughs> they pretty much. I think that's maybe one of the reasons they like it, like me, and it also really affect me back to the the, the item. Um, because the, the the whole propaganda painting uh, system we then literally adopted from the from the Soviet Union at that time. So we all got that, which is. Uh, they develop the own way in Chinese way as well. So we become like, a, we paint the way, it's a little bit like, a, I mean, now this days I can say really tacky now, right? But that time it's, it's the colors are bright and the surface just like, you don't need a, like a, that kind of a, a, a kind of a, what's called the texture of the uh, paintings, but you need that kind of a fresh and uh, or the shining, that kind of style. So that's literally, Light on, I took as my style. Romantic, uh, revol revolutionary right. romanticism. Exactly, exactly. and uh, yeah, so that's uh, one of the, one of the uh, kind of uh, term to describe the, the time we painted the way. It's part of our uh, fantasy as well. Yeah. And so can we have another slide, please? Um, so this is Guojian in your studio in the army, is it? Yes, yeah. So there, there you are very serious. Um, uh, very young. I was uh, I draw all of my soldiers. Yeah, all in, the, in the company. Right. So I just offer, offer them in secret, and then they said they have draw all, all, draw all of them. So that's how I really grab my skills. Now. Can we have another mm. slide, please? And so this is what he's done with that. Yeah. <laughs> We've now got revolutionary romanticism with. Um, what would you, how would you describe that? What's going on here? There's, uh, when I literally first trip back to uh, China, China started to like, have this kind of uh, nightclubs or karaoke. 90s. The 90s. From, they start have that. And then I was, I was kind of uh, uh, invited a few times to go to this kind of place. And then I was shocked, totally shocked, because uh, We've been told that in China we don't have the brothels, we don't have these kind of things, but they all happen in the in the in the nightclubs. And uh, I, seriously, I was really uh, happy to go to join the first time because I was thinking that, uh, again I, was, I had a dirty mind all the time, so I thought I might meet some. Guy. I literally dancing with the girls. I thought that they are really serious. I was trying to dance with them, and the girl told me, "Oh, you are so serious." I said, what do you mean? I said, like, I'm, I'm come here, I'll try to find a girlfriend. <laughs> but then I just found out that I didn't even have a chance. They all just hold the big guys, all the big guys there. I was just like, go there, they just want me to. So I, I just realized this, kind of a, a pop, a, not so like, what's the word, the uh, corruption? Corruption and uh, all this kind of uh, things happening really quickly, just totally changed the whole thing back to the the old days, totally changed. And so you see in here, the soldier who's uh, to the left of the girl in the bra, um, that's Lei Feng. He was Mao's model soldier. His image is everywhere in China. Everybody recognizes him. And then you see a mixture of like bosses, like, you know, rich men then and now. And um, yeah, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so, we're going to go back just one step. This is this is your uh, reflecting again on the army. But just to go back one step, you didn't end up going to the army um, artist institute when you got out of the army. 
tell us about how you got recruited to the art institute you did go to. I was, um, I mean, only three months when I joined the army. No, literally one month after I joined the army, they told me there's no way for uh, selection for the soldiers directly sent to the army art college anymore. So I was really disappointed. I was like a three months later. I just keep asking, so I have to. I want to go home. I don't want to stay here. So my. Um, like three years later, I got over lucky. Oh, I don't want to tell this, this too many stories. But <laughs> three years later, I'm back to my hometown, and I like I spent like two and a half year to trying to prepare. That time, literally, the university started. Uh, if you go to the pass your examination, you can go to the university now. That's the first year. So I thought, okay, I'll have to because I. I just realized that I'm so far behind of everything, so I have to pick up the books again, trying to remember everything, just try everything. But then, literally, I met one for my professor from the university on the street. I was pending there, preparing like everything, every time I tried to go to the examination, and then I saw her, she literally saw me on the street, and she said, oh, wow, I want to see your work. Can you take me to your house? So I took her to my house and then she saw my works and then she said, oh, you should have come to John Alva University. I said, oh, where's your university? She told me the, the name of the university. I said, oh, I just can't really go that because I'm far behind for everything. I don't really get a chance to get in. And she said, no, I, I think you are right. Just try this one, concentrate on this one, and then I think you will get in. Literally, I was trying three of the universities that time. I passed all of them. Three of them really want me to get in. And then I sent a letter to my professor and said, look, I got this kind of three offer now. Which one I should go? She said, forget the two. Right? Just concentrate with this one. So that's how I get into that. Yeah. The National Minorities Institute, Institute, which yeah. is um, a place that in Beijing, the Communist Party set it up. It's not. It's not called that anymore. It's kind of in. It's politically incorrect in China to talk about minority ethnicities. Yeah. But at the time, it was called the Minorities Institute, and it was. It's one of these things where they take outstanding uh, members of ethnic minorities from all over China, bring them into Beijing, and teach them various things. In this case, you're an art student. Um, so it's really interesting. It's a, it's a kind of again. I still have the what's the description before I join join them. Um, we literally is recruited as propaganda artist again to st study art as a propaganda. Um, they call the propaganda officer <laughs> for for for, for light and if you, uh, you back to your province to to kind of. Uh, promote the, the ideas of the, 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 the government. Yeah. So the kind of cultivating an elite uh, that would be pro the Communist Party, that could work with the Communist mm -hmm. Party in various places that were um, uh, basically ethnic minority areas. Um, didn't quite work out that well with you, did it? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I think, a bit, but again, it's the best time as well, because 1985 has become one of the best time in China, like five, four, five years until the, the shooting started. You know? So I, did, I didn't really have a good time there again. I didn't really seriously study anything there, but I had an opportunity to go look around in Beijing. Beijing was a fantastic time there. I see so many uh, underground shows or some of the shows from us China or the books or other things. And also it's like I was really tired of that when I joined uh, the university. First thing I was uh, really, really hired because uh, I was uh, selected to go to the People's uh, Congress as a model a student. And then 10 of us were being selected and uh, I was in, in charge in the class as well. So they put us there, they say, I, you have to dress up in your In your costume. ethnic costume, yeah. So, oh, okay. I said, oh, I, I, literally, I never had that costume myself. I said, I, said, I really want to see what's like. But then they put out totally different things to me. I said, oh, no, 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 this is not mine. And then not only just me, a few of them were, we just realized. 
and the guy in charge, he's like, fuck it, don't, don't, don't bother that, just put on. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Two of us, one of the, because we artists, that time we thought that we are kind of avant-garde, we said, no, no we don't want that. So we, we literally being refused to get into that by the, by the soldier. But then later, I just I, I promise I'm getting there, and I'll, I'll be dressed up. So they put us in the front front row as a model, right? And then because you were on the TV to show you are happy minorities. <laughs> so I, I didn't I didn't put on that whole thing. I didn't put on that. So after that, I was really really hate that place, and I just realized we've been like put into this kind of uh, place. Uh, it's kind of uh, like uh, we become the vast. Yeah, a, yeah, a flower a vase. Flower, in, in China, you call it a hua ping, a, yeah. a decorative vase. Yeah. Or we might call it a dancing bear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's really interesting because um, uh, two things about your studies there. One is that you studied uh, Gung Bi Hua, palace style paintings. And um, after a while, we're going to see more of the slides. And you'll see the uh, some of your recent work really draws on this palace painting style, which is a very fine, like finely detailed style. Um, but also, uh, when you see some of the later works, you'll also see some, uh, a lot of um, the use of minority costumes from around your area. So all that must draw on that experience, yeah? Yeah, no, yes, that's definitely from that, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit because I know the order of the slides, I think, that we chose. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about how you began to reflect on your, um, I know this comes later in your artistic career, but how you sort of reflected on your, your army time. Uh, what, what are you doing in a, in, a, in a painting like this? What are you showing us? This is the one thing is I think after Tiananmen uh, Massacre, I was, uh, I was uh, in, involved with that. I still remember the time from the beginning, before the shooting, I was trying to talk to the soldiers there, because everyone trying to talk to the soldiers. So I talked to the a bunch of soldiers that which the blocked the way when we're trying to go break through to go to Tiananmen Square, and then uh, I tried to talk to one soldier, and then I said, look now, we were just a student, we are not the enemies, why are you, you know, trying to do this? Now, None of them really answer anything. They just didn't want to talk. But then one of the soldiers really close to me, he just suddenly, he just said, I, look, you were a soldier before, right? And then, you know what? We just fucking follow the orders. So that's uh, really struck me after that. I just realized that um, we've been told to join the army. You join the army, you protect the people there. And, you only fighting to the enemies, but then I just realized who is the enemy? Who defined the enemy? Who decided to side who's the enemy? And then, and uh, after, especially after the shooting, I almost get killed there. And uh, I just realized they decide who is the enemy. And we literally, we even we put on the, the uniforms, become the soldier. You think you are the one? Definitely protected by them as well, but it literally is not going to happen. Yeah. Is is anybody just raise your hand? Um, no shame if you're slightly confused about the thing about we're talking about shooting, and I can just briefly wrap up that. Does everybody know what happened in 1989? No. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So. Oh. Okay. A brief. Oh. Okay. So the. Yeah, so basically the 80s were, were a time of incredible openness, as, as, as Guo Jian was saying, and so much cultural experimentation. And people began to get so interested in concepts like democracy, freedom of expression, and everything else. But what really triggered the protests in 1989 by students, it began with um, demands by various intellectuals for the release of political prisoners, including a guy called Wei Jingsheng, who had been held uh, for 10 years at that point. And they were saying, look, it's the anniversary, 1989, of the French Revolution, of the great 1919 May 4th movement for liberalization in China, of, of many different things. Um, and, you know, release the political prisoners. And meanwhile, students, people were very upset at the level of corruption, which is nothing compared to the level of corruption today, but it was shocking that people were, that officials were driving around in 
Mercedes Benzes, you know, and so the first slogans were like, sell the Benzes and save the nation. And then when, when the party responded to that by beginning to, this was April 15th, the whole thing kind of began cascading, or 14th, uh, when Hu Yaobang, a former party secretary who had been purged, and who had a reputation for being relatively liberal, he died. And that was the catalyst for students to start collecting in Tiananmen Square, on the campuses, talking about the problems. Already those petitions were out there about the release of political prisoners and so on. Um, and this whole thing began to cascade into a movement. When the Communist Party began clamping down on it, the students responded by taking over Tiananmen Square. And you were part of yeah. all of this, yeah. weren't you? Yeah from the beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah and, but you were a former soldier too, so your feelings on the scene. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, taken out of like a, I think, I think that's uh, one of the things. You, you've been forced to one step to another step now. And I didn't want to go to, seriously, I didn't want to go to, to the hunger strike from yeah. the beginning. There was a hunger strike that happened around in middle of May, I think? Yes. Yeah. 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 And the government was really pissed off because Gorbachev was going to be the first, um, the first Soviet leader to visit China since you know the break in the 1950s, and they wanted everything to go perfectly, and they wanted to greet him in Tiananmen Square. And there's all these ragged students lying there, and there's ambulances coming in and out, and the the government under Deng Xiaoping was furious, but they really got furious at the hunger strike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So like um, I was, uh, I, like, I, I joined that. I was thought like uh, I, I didn't really think about that much. No, I thought like uh, if you go back to the university, either way, you go back or go there, they will already see you as a bad guy only. So there's no way to 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 back up. No, no, no. And then of course on June third, fourth, the army moved in uh, to retake the square and. Um, they opened with live fire on the citizens who were blocking the roads to the square and at least a thousand people died. We don't know the final number. Many, many were wounded um, and you can't even talk about this in Tiananmen. Actually, I remember being in a cab and this young guy said to me, the driver goes, um, can you tell me about the Tiananmen incident? I said, sure. We which one? Because <laughs> there were several. I was just kind of testing, and he goes, you know, the big one. I was like, oh, you mean 1989? And he said, 1989? No, I, I mean the 2000s when the Falun Gong guy self-immolated. I said, you don't know about 1989? He knew nothing. Nothing. Yeah, that's uh, totally banned you know, to talk about that. Now, so in China now, so before I come back to Australia, we every year, literally start from now, this month, now in China, people like me and then we're trying to play the game like uh, the, the, the mouse and the, the, the policeman. And so we play the game and we send something, posting something on the internet. We try to survive for one second right? <laughs> to let the people to know. So we use different ways now. But, uh, yeah, so th that time still have a little kind of a, uh, a way to, to, to posting that. Um, we're going to go to a couple more slides. There's a whole bunch. Uh, so this is your studio, Parramatta Road, was it? Yes, that's I it. That. Yeah. <laughs> if you open the, uh, and now, now we'll go to, he yeah, um, that was very funny because if you open the steel roller door, you just saw your studio in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, next one. Uh, can we have the next? Yeah, perfect. So, do you want to talk us through these slides and then we'll go to what you did 25 years after 1989? Okay. This one is like, uh, um, I was invited back to China. I had a business, I gave up everything, and I thought, I, okay, I'm not going to do art, I'm not going to provoke it for them anymore, I'm, I'm trying to compromise myself. He ran a very good restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> and I uh, have a good uh, restaurant there, and then and then I start like a building, trying to build up my studio in China. I had a three studios actually, but then one by one they demolished them, and then I was forced to move out from one to another. And then one day, not only just happened to me, it happened to almost everyone at that time. So one time I was sitting there with a bunch of artists. They were saying, they were complaining. I was there, I was like, oh, okay, I have to do something. I said, okay, I'm going to make a balloon of uh, the Buddha. 
you know, to fly like a kite in the Tiananmen Square. And then one of the, the artists said, no, don't try that. One minute, you're gone. <laughs> so I thought, okay, in that case, I said, okay, I'm going to make a, a, some, some of the work about this. And uh, one of, when I told one of uh, the official, literally, friends, friends, uh, the, the kind of a government official, he was there. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to make a, a if they keep it demolishing my studio, I'm going to demolish Chairman Square. <laughs> so, and, then, and then he said, no, don't do that. You do that, you're gone as well. So I think that's literally tricked me. I, I'm kind of person, I, normally I don't really provoke anything. And then from that moment, I said, okay, I'm going to do that. Can I interrupt for a second? Yep. Can you tell us what year this was? Uh, 2009. Okay, Two and another thing about that time was that all over yeah. Beijing and a number of other cities, they were demolishing people's homes. They were demolishing all the old architecture to make room for really uh, just, you know, big things. And so Chai, there was a joke, Chai means to demolish, and China. <laughs> People said that's what China stood for. Um, it was demolish this. Um, but that was so the demolishing of the studios was part of a part of that that whole thing. Yeah. So you just went, I'm going crazy, and I'm going to make this. So yes. what did you make exactly? I made it the tenement uh, model, which is like a, almost like a bigger than this uh, stage, and then I made that, and then literally the guy who's uh, the the factory, the guy factory, and then he, he was really suspected about that, the whole idea. He said, we're going to do that. <laughs> what are you um, going to do with the model? The model, I said, um, and then he, I asked him, I asked the workers to start like a chop the things there, and he said, no, 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 why are you doing that? I said, oh, I just want to show people how they build up the Tiananmen Square. <laughs> so that's how I get through that. But then when I just got into my studio, and then I was being reported, and then I got the police come up, but literally they let me go they they ask me they say why are you doing this i just say, oh this is the idea i'm going to demolish the whole um, landmark cities or buildings around the world this is the only started so they say oh wow you're going to demolish the Times square or opera house i said yes yes and then they said let me go <laughs> the police are very interested in art in china <laughs> actually in the 1980s another friend of ours a Qian, um, he was doing, he was painting nudes and he was painting them out of uh, copying from art books and it was during the, I think it was the spiritual pollution campaign yep, yep, yep. and the police came by and they're like, oh, how did you paint these nudes? And he's like, I'm copying from art books and we need to take these away for further study. <laughs> <laughs> Very good with art, the police. Yeah. Um, let's see the next one. It's kind of hard to see these oh. slides in this in this room, but basically you had like helicopters coming around, you had explosions, you had the whole Tiananmen Square, all the buildings being like yeah. smashed. Yeah, that's a developed run. from the base, the first uh, idea to demolish that, but then, because at the same time I was traveling around uh, China to see the dem uh, demolition uh, site, so every time you go there, you see the bulldogs, the, all the sides just look like a um, war zone. And I was oh, okay, I was in the army, I already saw this kind of things. And then one, literally one, one thing, back to the old day when I was in Canberra. I went to Canberra to see the war memorial, and I saw this kind of uh, diorama there. So I said, oh, wow, I can make one like this as well. So I add, keep adding more things, add more things. And then they are, it's end up like this now, yeah. 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 Um, and that led to something that um, changed your life and got you inside a few walls uh, <laughs> that you weren't too happy to be inside. Um, 25 years after Tiananmen, so that was 2014? Yeah. Yeah, 2014. You made another artwork. Could we have another slide, please? And this also involved making a model of Tiananmen. So this is the 25th, it was in the preparation to the 25th anniversary of Tiananmen. You were interviewed by a Financial Times reporter who took a photo, published it, um, with your permission, of course. And the next thing you know, you've got a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Tell us what happened. 
Um, is, oh, but tell us what that is. What are we looking at? Okay, that, that's uh, again that's based on the mortar already made, but then I put the the, the meat, the minced meat over the meat um, pork. Yeah. Um, but the, I mean, I, I can tell the, the little bit of a story about this because I was uh, at the same thing like this time every year during the time when I was there. You always got the of officials come to warning you to think about the uh, Tiananmen massacre, which is like I was trying to forget that. And then every year this time they will remind me. And then I just got like really tired of that. And then they literally interview some people years before, some people waiting to do the interview. But then after that, no one really dared to do that. Again, so I got some of the media friends call me up and say, oh, do you think about, it? do you know any artists waiting to talk about this? I said, oh, many of them, they are involved with that. And then he said, no, no one really want to talk since last year. So at the end, I was really, really furious because I keep in God the officials come to warning me, which is I was the one trying to forget. And then I got really, really pissed off that one day I was again with a bunch of uh, artists that, that sitting there and also one of the government officials sit there as well. I said, I'm going to make a meet of Tiananmen Square. And then the guy said, don't dare to think about that. And then I said, okay, I'm fucking going to do that. <laughs> so I, I started like, a, I went to the market, it's close by. I, I, I went to the, the, the I uh, got the butcher, the local butcher, and then I bought a one kilo because I want to test that to, to if it's working or not. I went to that and working, and then I went back a few times. Uh, the, the, the butcher was really suspicious, and then he was saying, no, what the fuck are you going to do with this? I said, I, I said look, I'm, I just uh, try and uh, get as many as you can provide for me. So I ordered literally at the end, I ordered 160 kilo of uh, meat from him, directly from him, which he didn't really have that much. He, I don't know how he managed that. He rided the tricycle, come to my studio and walking and I saw the whole model there. It was like almost like this size. He was shocked and he said, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you doing this? So I thought, okay. He saw this now and he might report to me, so I have to really make a reason to calm him down. So I just say, okay, look, my, I said, look, this, this is, I got, the, uh, I got the job to promote the meat from the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he, he, he's really funny, he's a guy, he's like, he said, oh, my meat is not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I locked myself inside the studio for three days and I made this happen. And then three days later, it's like my studio, like pretty much like this high, but it's like a, a one and a one and a half of one hundred fifty square meters, and it smells so strong. I just can't stay anymore. So I have to open the door. When I open the door, and then someone already did. So they came in, came in and they take a photo. And literally, I got some of the records because that guy took a photo. <laughs> he took a photo with his phone and said, okay, I've got a really good camera. Why don't you just use my camera to take it <laughs> So he took the photos, so that's why I still have those sort of photos there. <laughs> <laughs> See, the police contribute to art in many yeah. different ways. I was like, my friends, I had an idea after that. And I said, I talked because one of my friends came up and, uh, to, to see me, to see me. He said, uh, do, you, do you want to get those sort of uh, files? how the police take a photo of you. I said, well, I definitely want it. I, mean, I thought if I can get that, this is going to be a big show. Right? I can show all of the how to take it, how to work it through these things. Right? Including the, the when they came to my studio, arrested me, same thing. They used two cameras, like a real camera, a film camera, two angles, film me to destroy them. I said, well, if I got that one, I said, a really big show. I could do that show. I said, I, I didn't have a plan, but I, now I do. <laughs> So the destruction of the destruction. Yeah. So the police came, they took you away, they put you in, in detention. jail. Yeah, detention. And uh, you didn't know whether you were going to be in there for a very long time. And meanwhile, everyone, all of his friends in Australia, we were just, we were sweating buckets. We were talking to diplomats. We were trying to figure out what was going to happen. Um, so what was it like in prison? Is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> so I was uh, seriously first. The first night, I was thinking that I thought that the the first cell to put me in there, and uh, um, 
those guys, bunch of guys, are still up there. The, normally, you after nine, you have to sleep now. But they all half naked. They're standing there. I thought, wow, shit, they're going to rape me. And I said, I was really terrified. But then, I think because uh, some of the guy there, uh, they call the tough guy. The tough guy there, uh, he, he kind of, uh, I don't know why he's so nice to me. <laughs> I said next to me to him. So You're I, cute, funny. <laughs> yeah, I shot it to him. I start asking him that he show how his uh, his kind of uh, bruise or his kind of a cut from his uh, fist, and he told me the story. That's kind of things. But again, uh, so inside that the next day they changed me to the other one, uh, which is much much nicer. But uh, again, uh, like twenty four hours, there's no lights turn off. You have to sleep at night, and then the bed is just like full of them which is uh, for only for eight people, but you've got like 50 or 80 people sleeping there. So you have to like squeeze it into there. And um, yeah, and um, they use this kind of a technique to make people hide each other as well inside there. It's especially they got like a, two of us look Chinese, but Australian and another guy is far away. And two of us, and then they make us like uh, in China say if you are Chinese but you are another citizen from another country you are Han Jian which is you are the traitor. So they and also the the food the serving the food they are totally different as, as well. So we got the bread and the milk which is not real milk. It's just like they put some powder there make it like a, you can see through right. That's kind of uh, milk to us to make the Chinese there looking they are so bad there. So they make us a little bit good than the, the local Chinese, which is really shit. They treat them like shit. And not literally we don't really look good at all, but then they make the Chinese say, why you treat the traitors much better than us? So people literally hate each other inside. And luckily after uh, two weeks, which is kind of the limit that they can hold you before officially charging you, um, the Australian um, diplomats managed to do their good work, and um, and we got word that uh, that that um, <laughs> that Guo Jian was coming back on a flight. He'd be he'd be arriving at what 6:30 in the morning or something. So <laughs> we were told by we're in touch with your family and everything else, and we figured you'd be quite traumatized. And we didn't want it. The press began calling me and everybody else who knew Guo Jian. Like, do you know, is he coming, you know, what's going on, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. Meanwhile, we, um, I go with a friend to the airport, um, and we're there at like six or whatever it is, uh, waiting for the plane, and we see this whole massive bank of press, right? The, every, all these television reporters, and there was a plane coming in from Los Angeles, and we were like, must be some big movie star coming, you know, like, like <laughs> what's going on? Like, the last I knew, the ABC, nobody knew when Guo Jian was coming, right? And then Guo Jian gets off the plane, and it's like, <laughs> they all rush you. <laughs> How did that feel? That was, I mean, that's really funny. The, they sent me to the plane from the, from the, the day when I get to leave there. They literally uh, sent me to the bus, I was like a fully carried guns, I officers carry guns, sent me there. And get on the plane, I didn't know what's going on, and then the guy just said, oh, all your friends are just there, but you can't see. I was like, why are you tell me that? This is in Beijing. In Beijing. Yeah. And then they put me on the plane, and I went get on the plane, and I got the, someone tap on the shoulder saying, okay, you got a letter from the Australian embassy. And I said, you definitely got someone to to meet you at the airport because I was worried about it. I didn't have anything with me. I only got a no uh, money. Uh, twenty six dollars, which is not even enough for me to go from uh, from my airport to the city. I was but then the letter told the Linda was there and I was, some of your friends there. So I was like, okay, I'm really happy. And then I was sitting there and then nobody around me. And then I said, like, okay, can I have a beer? <laughs> And the hostess just said, no. I said, oh, why? I said, okay, just me or because me or just everybody? They said, no, just you. <laughs> so I couldn't have a beer. No. And then, but when I get there, I thought, because I knew you guys were going to wait for me there. So I went to the bathroom, 
put the, because I was still in the shorts, right? and was my sleeper, right? so things, so I put the change and everything, and then come out, I, I wanted like a, uh, still looking good, right? <laughs> but I still, like, I think I still remember the day when I first look at myself in the mirror, I look like a cat, right? my whiskers just come out. <laughs> so, but I was really happy to see Linda there, and then, but then when the press come out, I was really shocked as well, you know? I just keep myself, I'm tired, I, I want to go somewhere to have a rest, but you, I didn't know where to go, and I think they said, come with us. <laughs> it was like, it was literally that kind of surreal situation where you're like, no comment, no comment, no comment, and we're pushing along the luggage thing, and the, the press is running after us, they're running in front of us backwards, you know, and it was so strange, wasn't it? it must have been much stranger for you, even, because you'd come out of the prison. Now, we're going to um, go through some of the other work, uh, but I just want to, before we leave this one, um, I just want to talk about, you had this great idea on the 30th anniversary, now you can't go back to China, etc. And um, in Carriage Works, they were doing, um, it was the artist profile, invited you to recreate this in Carriage Works for Sydney Contemporary. And you had this great idea, like you were going to do it huge, and there was going to be like rats, and there was going to be cockroaches, and what happened? Um, yes. Finally, yeah. <laughs> I was really excited when uh, when the idea came up. They said, "Okay, you could like uh, we could give you a, a, a big room, which is 18 by 18 meters, the biggest uh, room in the in the carriage work." I was so excited. I was like, "Wow, that's I'm definitely you know I'm definitely going to do that." So I designed everything to match the requirements of safety, raising all the things. And then we, at the same time, I was talking to the, uh, the magazine. They are literally trying to get uh, the company get involved to how to frozen the whole building to like, that you, you don't really see the decaying sort of things. And, uh, yeah, so, but then I changed the, I have to change the ideas because of the, the kind of requirement for, for the, for different kind of reasons. And at the, at the end of this, I, oh, we literally got the, the company waiting to give us the meat and also come to freezing the whole area. I said, wow, this is going to be really huge. I was really excited. But the thing at the end of this, oh, this is because there's a room next to some of the restaurant there. They are not like it. But then the, the, at the end of the day, when the opening, I went there, there's no restaurant there. No oh. restaurant there. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm just saying, that's like a, I think people from the beginning, they got the really excited as well. But at the end, they just thought like, this too much for health that. and safety yeah, yeah. health and safety no? <laughs> but then they, imagine that if you get the, like a whole room of meat there you when you don't build up anything just meat there no? so the, i was so excited no? because uh, for the art history when i was in beijing no? back, back to the whole uh, time in 1985 when we had the first show from america uh, rosenberg had the show there People like me got really shocked. They would say, okay, we can't really do anything because those guys have already done everything. There's no more way for us to make it any, make through there, nothing there. This is 1985, Robert Rauschenberg had yeah. a show at the National Gallery in Beijing and China, China's artists just, it just blew everybody's mind. Like, this is just a bunch of junk put together. This is like ripped up paintings. Yeah. Like, oh my God, where do we go? Yeah. And they did find places to go. Yeah, so yeah. More, more, more my friends, a few of my friends give up to artists, they don't want to be artists anymore, <laughs> so after that, I, said, I was like really excited, I was like, wow, this is literally, you've got a new way to do, or new way to think about that, but then you literally stuck with a lot of things, everything you do, they just realize, they already done, right? but then they all found the meat one, I said, oh shit, I found a way. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go through some uh, of the other slides fairly quickly, um, I'm not sure, are we going to have, uh, Mark, do, do we have Q and A, or do we? Um... Okay, we'll see if we get through everything. So this is again kind of hard to see, but this is uh, from your hometown in more. This is before you got kicked out, um, but you were doing this investigation. So you went to your hometown. You see all of the garbage. Can we have the next slide? So tell us, like the kind of stuff that was on this mountain of trash. Yeah, um, as during the time I was like, I literally I start filming or taking photos back to like early 2000. 
that would, every time we want to travel back to China, I take it just with a really shitty camera. Uh, yeah, and then, then um, oh, 2009, and uh, I got the camera as a gift my sister bought for me, really good one at the time. So I was like, okay, this is the time, so I'm going to uh, travel uh, for, uh, around China to take the photos because that at the time it was really people talking about the rubbish, the pollution, everything about that. But people all concentrated about it, the big cities. But I thought, okay, my place, one of the places in China considered as the most beautiful, green, clean place. I thought, okay, I, I had the idea, I thought, must be not clean anymore. <laughs> Uh, but the, the people I talk with, with my friends, they say, no, I believe this new thing. So I just realized when you don't want to see things, you don't see things. So it's, I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. So I went back there and uh, I was so, that's really shocking me. And I took so many photos. I was literally followed by the local officers as well. One, one time, the, the one officer from the local, from the village, he took me to the, to the they say the most beautiful area, which is that one. I took the photo, I set up the, uh, the camera, I took the photo, and I, he, I didn't notice that. Because my mind still didn't want to see. Huh? But the, the officer came up and he says, why are you taking this shit photo with the, all the rubbish? I said, no, 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 I'm taking really beautiful area, the scenery. He said, no, there's all the photo there. And it just literally reminds me about this. So the, I started keeping taking photo, photos of rubbish, but the one day, I just saw those smiling, sexy faces among the, among the rubbish. Again, again, as before, I didn't want to see, I didn't think about that, I didn't see that. But from that moment, I just see everywhere just those sort of, uh, uh, famous, uh, famous, sexy, uh, uh, smiling faces. So celebrity pictures, mm. minor celebrity pictures. Can we have the next slide, please? Mm. So this is uh, like all the different little um, faces from the rubbish. Uh, made into a kind of pixels, basically. And can we see the next one and then you can tell us what you're doing? So this is a famous Song Dynasty painting. Yeah. And if you look close, what is it? Uh, they all just based on the, those sort of pictures of uh, rubbish or the face uh, faces. Um, I mean, again, those are like I was a Chinese art kind of student. I even didn't know that painting during the time I was studying. That's so famous, like when you go to around the world, you, everyone will talk about Mona Lisa, everyone knows that. But you talk in China, the famous Chinese painting, you talk to most of the Chinese people, they don't know. So I was like, okay, but everyone knows those, I mean, I'm not against the fam famous people, I'm, I'm not against them, but people do know all of them famous people. And then they are the one promoting all the, this kind of rubbish as well. The promoting this uh, uh, production as well. But then the movies, most of the movie or TV shows in China, they're kind of a rubbish as well, uh, to me. So this is the whole idea I'm trying to put it into the a famous painting based on the sort of famous rubbish as well. And if, if you look at Guo Jian's website, um, you can see some of these up close and see the way that that's composed of pixels of people, um, kind of rubbish celebrities on rubbish. Um, it, it's all a, comp a composite. Can we have uh, the next slide, please? So now the next several slides, we'll just, because we were yeah, sort of running out of time. Let's just go to the next slide, please. This is from the latest series. There's Xi Jinping. Another one, please. And now this is where we're talking about the palace painting techniques, very, very detailed. Okay, do you want to talk now about just this series in brief? Um, this is uh, the time uh, during the uh, uh, pandemic uh, um, because uh, uh, my parents was here uh, from the beginning, but then they all back to uh, China. My dad literally stayed in, in Australia for seven months and then still going back to China and they still don't really believe you could get into that really hardship in, in China to live in there. My dad literally died during the pandemic um, uh, in the hospital, which is, uh, he still not counted as COVID related. So lots of people being, being killed or died during the time, they are not allowed to tell 
say you die from the COVID. This is one of the thing. But and also at the same time, the, how they lock down the cities, the way they treat the people. I, I mean, today, thank you for the for the for the internet. You can watch so many awful things are happening there. And then again, it's like a, like my generation, my dad's generation. We are so what's the words ideal kind of. Uh, um, uh, uh, idealists. 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 Yes. We all trust that even we, like me, I, I didn't really trust that much, but my dad is still like, I said, oh, come on, nothing really go worse than that. So that's how he went back to China. And I, I just keep warning him, I said, Dad, just don't go, not this time. And they didn't give him, they didn't want to give the uh, uh, vaccine. For the older people, I said, "How come you go? You guys so do everything opposite. I rather want the old, like the old people to do that first. But in China, they don't. They they don't give. The, they didn't give the the, the the erection to the old people. So I literally forced my dad to go to the local kind of a, a, a hospital or clinic. I just said, go there. Just ask them to 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 to, to, to get the vaccination." So my dad literally got it twice, but then when he was in the hospital, it's time to have third one, and they then refused to give my dad. They just said, oh, no need, because in hospital, so many people here. And uh, yeah, so I literally watched my dad die in the hospital through my phone. So this is kind of my response to, 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 the, to the pandemic, or to the kind of period of time. You know? uh, I got many of them. This, this is one of them, but I've got many, many of them I'm going to have a show soon. So, so that's why I didn't really put one. I don't want to put that much to hear. So, yeah, and walls feature very heavily in this series. The walls that keep people out, lock people in and all that. Um, we have like five, I think we have what, five minutes? No, we don't have time. We have to wrap up. Okay. All right. Uh, so sorry about that. I'm sure a lot of you have your questions. We we will be outside there, um, and you can all mob Guojian with your questions then. But thank you, thank you, Guojian, and no, thank you, and thank you everyone for coming, and thank you, Addie Road. This has been really, really fun. Thank you.